Hello and welcome to a new episode. This is our fifth episode of That Christian Panel here on Deprogrammed. And uh, we're very excited you could join us tonight. My name is Carrie Smith. I'm one of your panelists and I'm here with uh, Brahma Bull, Odin, Force of Light, WDW Pro. I'm going to let each of them say hello and introduce themselves a little. WDW Pro is our special guest tonight. So why don't you start, sir? Well, hello there. It's an honor to be on, and I'm looking forward to uh, making something that could be esoteric, more pragmatic, let's say. So I, I'm excited to see what everyone else has to say about the work by C.S. Lewis. I just love your voice. Well, <laughs> it's, you. a, it's a great <laughs> voice. <laughs> so happy you could be here. Um, I, did, I should have said, I, my husband and I are on the road, and so this is my temporary setup at my mother-in-law's house. And my internet's not great. So if you guys lose me, just keep going. There you go. Okay. <laughs> just keep streaming. Just keep streaming. Not yeah. swimming, of course. Hello, Michelle. Oh, Michelle. Gosh. There you go, Carrie. Now you're officially part of the, the glasses team. <laughs> it's the season. Odin, where are your glasses? <laughs> we need the gentleman to have glasses. Like, pro's got them. I'm doing my best. <laughs> Pro has them. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that we all had to wear glasses tonight. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for the info. I did. It was just a spontaneous. Michelle, I could, I knew I could count on her to have some of these. I didn't have to say anything. No. Yeah, I've, I've got a box full. <laughs> Michelle, how are you? I'm doing good. It's good to be here uh, and ready to talk about this uh, incredible work by C.S. Lewis who just continues, I just continue to love C.S. Lewis more and more. Was this your first time reading Screwtape? It was, this, it was my first time reading this book. Fantastic. Yes. That's great. I quite enjoyed it. <laughs> How are you, Brahma Bull? Oh, you're muted. I'll translate. He said, <laughs> it's the worst day of my life, yet I look so dapper. There we go. Is that better? But that's better. Thanks for the translation, WDW. W -D -W. Um, Listen to that radio voice on this man. Beautiful. I know. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was like my uh, my third, fourth, and fifth reread of this? I think I think we all kind of went through it a couple times, didn't we, over the past couple weeks? But uh, yeah, really excited to talk about it. I I'll be surprised if we're able to get to everything we want to within one episode. Honestly, <laughs> we could have broken this out into like, you know, letters one through eight and then nine through yeah. 16 or whatever. But uh, yeah, we'll see what we can get through tonight because it's great stuff and great to see everybody. Good, Good to, to see you guys. Hello, Odin. Oh, hello. Uh, as much as I do love C.S. Lewis, this is also my first time uh, having read through the awesome. screw tape letters it's been on my to-do list for years probably for even well over a decade at this point uh like I, I i went out of my way i remember i think it was in college to buy a version of the text and i just never had the time just to sit down with it and read it so this time being able to to read the text but then also to listen to uh one of the many audiobook versions of it um and the one that i had on audible was from uh the narrator was ralph uh Kasham, i think is his name and he was brilliant. I tried listening to uh, to the one that I know that you were a big fan of, Carrie. The John Cleese. The John Cleese. And I, I liked it. But for me, I guess, like, the audio just sounded so dated. It was hard for me to, to uh, listen to. I the have to tell inhales you. inhales got me, too. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of inhales. I have to tell you something. So this was only my second time reading it. I read it a couple years ago. But this time I noticed so much more. Mm -hmm. And this time I listened to it. And my husband and I were driving um yesterday to come visit my mother-in-law and i had the john cleese version on and there's a youtube playlist it's free mm -hmm. and and it's you know he's a brilliant actor and he's so funny and so he's you've got him reading and we got to like i think it was around chapter 26 or so and you're listening to him the whole way and he's like my dear one would you know and then all of a sudden because each chapter with this was its own video all of a sudden the playlist goes to an AI generated voice because I guess 
they those two videos got taken down chapter 27 and 8 got taken down or something so you're going from listening to this amazing actor voice it and then all of a sudden the next chapter is like my dear one word it's, it's like, oh <laughs> it was so rough. jarring we were like no we screamed i can't listen to that not after you know he so brilliantly embodied this demon but um but yeah if you if you guys are watching and you have not read the book yet listen to any of the audio audiobook versions if you want to do it quickly because or it's a quick read but i think this book in particular reads it, it's almost like a radio play yeah mm -hmm. and and listening to it is is a, a different experience so mm -hmm. um well well where should we start so I know you said Brahma Bull that we could maybe even have enough material to split this up into several episodes. Do you have it organized in your mind in a better way than I probably do of how you want to approach it? Or should we just each start talking about it? Really. Okay. I, I started I, actually I, I, I taking definitely notes take around. Care. I have general notes. <laughs> Me yeah. too. I have general notes and I've got some about spe some specific letters, but uh, I didn't start that until about 17 or 18. So yeah, I have one of these um, like uh, ones that you can like write on tablets. And so like yeah. the whole time I'm reading it, I'm just like, oh, that's good. It's like, I was like, I need to, we need to focus on that. And then uh, I had to take yep. care of my daughter. And so I wasn't able to do that anymore. So then I switched to the audio book and then I pulled up like a, a notepad on here and just kept writing things down. And I still have three pages of notes from that. So it's like there's just so much depth to to the work. And I guess that's also one of the problems that. <laughs> That a lot of us have is that we're you know very passionate about our faith and so we just recognize certain things and we're like oh okay i like that i need to i need to mark that down it's hard not to be an academic mind yes. when reading c.s lewis yes yeah yeah well just one quickly somebody in the chat has a question will listening to this pod spoil the book i don't think so i don't think it's that kind of book i think you're still very much going to enjoy it mm -hmm. um but uh one other quick thing i should say i should have said at the beginning if you're new here, this is a panel show we do. It, we're coming from a Christian perspective, obviously, but we all have different backgrounds and experiences. And if you're new here, um, non-believers are definitely welcome in the chat. So don't feel like uh, you have to you have to be one of us, one of us yet. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> so know, who would like to start? That might be interesting. Uh, you know, I always like to start at the beginning. I don't know if this is technically the beginning, but. Uh, it, it is interesting to me that C.S. Lewis apparently did not enjoy writing these. And so yeah. that might be somewhere interesting to start. Yes. Is you all have enjoyed reading it so much, some for the first time, some for the second time. And yet the man himself did not take much uh, pleasure out of creating it for us. So maybe we'd start there about why that would be and uh, what you all think might have been the impetus for doing this. Well, I would just say um, with that, because that caught my attention too, Pro, um, it just would take a toll on your mind and spirit to constantly be viewing things from the other side when you are a Christian, the way C.S. Lewis was. And, and I think he said, because uh, I, I listened twice, that like th this book just kind of came to him is the way it kind of sounded. He just kept writing and writing. But with that being said, I, I absolutely could see writing this type of work beginning to uh impact you as a christian he said i think i read somewhere that he said that that's exactly the case Mich michelle that he that substituting the good for the bad and the bad for the good got to be exhausting having your mind figure that out so for anyone who yeah. hasn't read it yet the the book is it's a series of letters written uh, from the perspective of a demon to another demon, to his nephew, who is sort of schooling in how to um, lead his patient astray, his patient being a human. And there are all these reversals in the, and it, when you first start reading it, you're, you're like, what's going on here? When he talks about the enemy. He's talking about God. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, yes, I can imagine that would get to be very tiring doing having to do that and and our father below <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah well the actual quote was though i had never written anything more easily i never wrote with less enjoyment yeah and it was also since we're starting at the beginning the interesting thing on who the book was dedicated to yeah i don't know if it'll show up the mm -hmm. jrr tolkien mm-hmm 
Who's that amazing. guy? Yeah. Just yeah. amazing that they were besties, right? And, and like <laughs> that, I, I think I mentioned this last time, I would love to have been in a room with them just talking because Lord knows the conversations that they had and just the, the level of discourse that those two must have had, especially on you know matters of faith, but also just matters of the world as well. Somebody should do a series about them. Not Disney. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone but Disney. <laughs> no, it, I actually thought of that. It would be good if like either Angel Studios or the other studios that did Jesus Revolution, uh, if they would do something with the two of them, because that would be fascinating. Yeah. Mel Gibson. That'd be a fun one. <laughs> Is Mel Gibson playing someone in this? <laughs> No, I mean, he doesn't play anybody in The Passion. You know? Yeah, so, so just I, him making it. So just, I, he's the kind of person where I feel like he would bring that level of like gravitas and seriousness to it. Because obviously it does need to be, it, it's very comical too. Like that's the, one of the things that you enjoy about it is, and I guess that's also kind of how you could see why he didn't enjoy writing it. Because in a way you're, you're reading this and it's two demons, right? And this specific way, it's just the one uncle right writing to his nephew the entire time but then there's these moments where you just laugh like one of my favorites is early on where he talks about of all humans the english are in the respect of the most deplor deplorable milk sops and like he <laughs> talks about like the english a lot and i just i really appreciate it uh just throwing those kind of jabs in there about the english people and uh <laughs> just again there's fun things the mentions of different people that are throughout the entire the, his jabs at humans in general. Mm -hmm. Yes, he he hates humans. He the, the way the he, vermin, the vermin, yes. the two legged, two -legged beast, animals. two legged animals, the woman who's the love interest, and his he goes on this yeah. diatribe <laughs> about her. Uh, oh, I forget the word that he used. I had it written down, but it's just like, oh, there's just so many just amazing uh, moments as far as just the. Uh, as I said, if you've not read this, you really should, because I'm just so happy that I finally had a reason to. <laughs> well, in addition to being, I think it's a it's very funny um, book, but it's also really thought provoking. And there were several times where, like you said, Michelle, you listened to it twice, where I had to rewind it to listen, think about what he was saying. And I don't know if I'm going to articulate this well, but one of the things I liked about it is um, it challenges your assumptions about so many things or it did mine and the first example that comes to mind is and it's it's humor but it also makes you think is um when he's talking about um like whenever he's giving the the younger demon advice on how to to tempt the human or to lead him astray he's like you want to make him cowardly, but you don't want to make him too cowardly. If you make him too cowardly, then he has a tendency to like pray, call upon God, and that might backfire. Yeah. So it's always this sort of, it's not exactly what you think it's going to be. Does that mm. make sense? Yeah. Yes. He, well, he likes to say, this might seem like the most logical route, but don't <laughs> fall into that trap. He's like, don't be naive enough to think that that is the way forward. And then that nuance that he brings to describing exactly how to, to tempt somebody in this way. And I also I love how it's always been it's always made very clear, and he even mentions it right. Uh, Screw tape mentions this several times that we can't create anything, we can't build anything. All we can do is is corrupt. All we can do is twist. And he's like, at one point he says that's one advantage that the other side has in a very un you know fair fashion, right? And so you know they they have all these great pleasures, and we have to twist them into something else. Um, yeah. I also right. think the, that the... C.S. Lewis was likely uh, inspired in terms of how the demons would uh, strategize by mm -hmm. uh, Revelation 3. And so out of Revelation 3, you might find, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that a common theme that runs throughout the screw tape letters is that the demons want mundanity. They do not want mm -hmm. people to focus on the things that matter, but rather they would like them to spend time thinking about the mundane issues of each day or the mundane annoyances that happen. Uh, going into even, for example, the sciences. Uh, in today's culture, many people believe that science and religion are exclusively at odds. And in this book, C.S. Lewis proposes that 
actually learning the sciences, according to these demons, learning science and learning some of these uh, other academic endeavors might lead you to God. And so it's better for yes. someone to be completely milquetoast and, and lackadaisical. Yeah, with the real sciences. That's what That's I love to too. Is like with oh, the yes. real sciences, it is. But if it's something like it mentions sociology, and, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and so I just I love that too because there's obviously also a lot of C.S. Lewis's own thoughts about the modern day sciences of his time that were clearly moving in a direction that was pushing God away. Um, and so he said, "Oh yeah, the real sciences you want to be careful because those will bring closer to God. But the fake sciences, oh, you could be a little bit more open to bringing him that way." He even says, as an aside, we've actually lost a few scientists this way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, and I was thinking, oh, there's a few references like that where I, I was like, oh, I need to go look up who those scientists were later. I did it. But he's got a few very um, time specific, specific to that time period references that I didn't, I didn't know who he, he was talking about. But, and pro now that I'm looking at my notes, I actually wrote down the quote that is actually in the book where he says a moderate religion is no religion at all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, going back to what you're saying, too. Revelation 3. <laughs> yep. The, well, and, the, oh, continue. Go ahead. No, no, please. Well, I was going to kind of say something else. So you go with what you're about to say. <laughs> well, what I was going to say is that one of the things that I find fascinating, especially in our modern times, is that there seems to be a an association with the idea of being athe atheistic or agnostic mm -hmm. with that being uh, an intellectual enterprise. And so then if you are someone who does not hold to either agnosticism or atheism, then you are seen in some circles as being less intellectual. And yet the argument here is that I think C.S. Lewis is saying that the sciences, by learning them, then you learn that the universe is intelligible. And mm -hmm. things that are intelligible t tend to come from, from intelligence. And so... Uh, to get to the point where I think these demons in the book want you to be, which is a place of saying there is no meaning, right? Nihilism and and just mm -hmm. going through the droll experience of life uh, without the beauty and well, without the appreciation for each day and the moments of each day. The only way that you can do that really is, I think, through the modern attempt to strip out the meaning of consciousness. And it's a very strange denial that we go through in in, in life when we attempt to take the very foundation of what allows us to experience the universe at all and gives the universe every single drop of meaning that it has and then try to argue that away as being some sort of uh, hallucination or uh, some sort of trickery in the, in the cosmos. And it's like, well, if it's a trick, it's everything that you hold dear. And if, if your experience, if your qualia, if your consciousness and your endeavors, uh, if they have any meaning at all, then you should also consider that they're outside the scope of what we understand at this time. And if they're outside the scope of what we understand, then that points to more that might be outside of the scope of what we understand, including the potential for a creator. And so I see what C.S. Lewis is suggesting there, that once you begin to move past the Richard Dawkins kind of uh, thought process where everything is just atoms, and when, once you begin to think about, well, what if that's not the case? What if, what if materialism is insufficient for an explanation? Then you begin to go on a journey towards God and beyond just the here and the now. And so uh, uh, I can't remember the exact quote in the book, but there's a there's a place where he, he remarks that you don't want the humans to begin noticing that there's things beyond what they can see and touch. And yes. I thought that was a mm -hmm. I thought that right. was a great line and one that we uh, perhaps should be remembering even more so today than when it was originally written. Yes. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. Was that when he was well, talking about what's real? Oh, go ahead. Who did I talk about? Oh, no, go for it, Carrie. No, Brahma, you go. Well, I was just going to say one of the other lines that he kind of came up with in the book that kind of also works along with that is um, when he was talking about men's belief that they own their own bodies or mm -hmm. that they own anything. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that kind of works with what Pro was just saying. Um, and that in reality, you don't own anything. You don't even own your own body. There is no bodily autonomy. You were brought into the world against your will. Nobody nobody got to make a decision that they were going to come into the world. It just happened to us. And everything that happens from then, it's, I mean, it's happening to you. But, I mean, it's I'm not exactly sure how to explain it. But uh, what C.S. Lewis is kind of getting at is, yeah, there is no autonomy everything's being done in service of somebody or something 
Mm-hmm. So that points how... to the creator too, to the mm-hmm. agnostic or to the atheist. Yeah, and that's how the the demon right screw tape tries to say this is how you can twist it right is that if you make right. everything about my right yes. when, like if you mentioned saying even when we're even when humans are young it's about it's my toy and it's not about it being or my teddy bear uh, and it's not about it being uh, oh this is my teddy bear that this person who I care for gave to me. And he's like, be careful because they will sometimes try to let that be the lesson that's taught. But rather, it's mine. It's I own it, so I can literally tear it apart if I if I want to. Um, right. And I, I thought that that was just very interesting. How again that use of my and eventually you can use it to say my God. And now it's no longer this other image he builds is is that this perception of God is oftentimes this false reality, right? Because if it turns into my God, now it's my own understanding of God versus actual re- worship of the one God. Um, and so I thought that was also interesting. So there's, yeah. there's two things that I want to hop off on from what you guys have said, if that's okay. Um, it, it, this strays a little bit farther from the book, but it's so important in my view, may not be uh, important to anyone else, but who knows, maybe somebody will appreciate this. But uh, Brahma, when you were talking about, we do not make a decision to come into the world that, that it's thrust upon us. Um, I don't, I don't know how many people out there have, have been in the presence of a newborn, you know, coming into life and, and uh, you know, experiencing the world for the first time. But, uh, it's it's poignant, and yeah. it, during that time, there's a thing. I believe it's called the golden hour. Now, I, I, it's been a while since I've taken child psychology, but um, there's an hour of time there where, if a newborn is uh, treated very kindly and held against, let's say, its mother or held uh, by the father or even a nurse, you know, if 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 there's human contact and a feeling of security. It has a dramatic impact on the child's mm-hmm. development and maybe even for our entire lives, which is completely mm-hmm. uh, outside of our own control. None of us decided that. But I think that really speaks to the need for love and care. And it's it's like if you try to if you try to take that idea and 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 boil everything down to mere materialism to play off of mere Christianity, if you attempt to boil everything down to mere materialism, there's like this entire thing written into the cosmos about love where how you are treated in your first hour has a dramatic influence over the rest of your life. And then I think I've lost the second thing. Fooey. Darn my <laughs> mind. I think, I've, I think I have lost the second thing that I was going to say. No, I have, I've got it again. Uh, Odin, to go, to go what you were saying, um, it's interesting to me that whenever we're dealing with items, uh, you know, things that have been given to us or things that have meaning beyond just the physical constraints or the attributes of it. This is another thing that I think points to in everyday life. We don't act as if all that there is, is just the physical atomic, you know, reactions and physics. And that is take, for example, let's say that uh, you go onto eBay tonight and let's say that there's a guitar that was owned by Joe Smith or Juan Gonzalez there's going to be a price point attached to that. And now let's say that there's also a guitar on eBay and it was owned by Elvis. Now those guitars could be materially exactly the same. And yet society will, uh, will assign a value to those guitars that is distinctly different. And the, the assignment of the economy to those two different guitars, although they are physically exactly the same, but the assignment by society is metaphysically different. And so we, we live in a world where we act every day as if the metaphysical is true, as if the world of values is true. And I think that's what the demons are trying to get people not to do, but only when it is in the face of how you would treat the divine, how you would treat God. And in that situation, you want to strip away the values and say there is no such thing. And yet in the world, we live every day as if things have more than just their physical autonomies. Yeah, the perceived value, sentimental value. And I want to say off of, okay, off of point one of what Pro made, uh, going back to his example of a newborn, that's because humans were made in fellowship. Uh, Man and then woman were made in the image of the triune God. Let us make men in our image. We were made in fellowship to dwell in fellowship and communion with that God. And in that fellowship, we were created in love and acceptance. And anything foreign to that, even from the time you are a baby, is a deviation of how humans were created to be. Uh, That's yeah, an I mean, excellent point. The, the proper the proper pathway forward, even biologically, is love. 
Yes. That's And that's a powerful thing because you can't strip, you could attempt to take that out and you can attempt to sterilize it with language that will make it seem not quite as, as meaningful as it is. But love is built into the cosmos and it's built into how it will impact the way that you navigate the world forevermore after those, uh, those first moments of your life. Absolutely. And, and going off of what Brahma Bull said, it's interesting. It must have hit you as it hit me. One of the things, I mean, that hit me directly in the heart, like in a, even a, a level of, I guess you could say, uh, conviction challenging me. I am the type person I am highly impatient. That's something the Lord has dealt with me for years, uh, even kind of through the through the idea that compassion in a very in a very literal sense could be just giving a person some of your time. Um, but anyways, I'm, I am a I am a very impatient person, and the whole thing on I mean literally brought me to tears as I thought about it, and and it's become something I've begun to pray is the fact that it's like, and it goes back to even Psalm. I, I'd have to quote, it's, I believe it's in the 30, the 30 is of, of the Psalms, but my, my time is in your hands. Mm. And back to that idea that, because I'm that way, my time, my time is valuable. And it's like, no, Michelle, your time on this earth has been allotted to you by God. And it's really all God's anyways. And he goes through that whole thing, you know, the woman that's that's that the old lady that is uh, kind of a nuisance to you. Well, if God was here and that's what he wanted you to do, you would find that such an easy task to go do for the Lord. And that that whole thing about time uh, being belonging to God is something I think if we all really grasp, that's like life changing. That uh, part yeah. also, I'm I'm glad you both brought that up because that that was one of the ones that really struck me as well and it made me think of i don't know that verse in psalm i have to look that up but it made me think it's of psalm james 31. so you were right oh i knew it was in the 30s, in the 30s. Yeah. <laughs> my times are in thy hand deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors well there's one in james maybe you know this one i think it's james where it's the one about when you pray you you shouldn't say you know tomorrow i'm going to go to such and such town and james do this Fogg. okay but you should say if god wills it i'm going to go to such and such town and do this and it made me think of that verse and it made me think of um because he was saying that that it's not misfortune alone that will cause a man to become resentful or angry it's misfortune perceived as injury mm -hmm. and time being one of those things that we think we own but we don't but we think we own it that that's one of the easiest to make you angry if you had planned on doing something and then you can't do it. Or if you had planned on have talking to your friend at the party and you have to talk to that annoying person at the party, or, you know, as you said, give time to that person. And, and, and uh, it, it gives you so much to think about. And, and my husband and I, we, we talked about this, this past summer, we, our van broke down in Colorado and it gave us the opportunity to talk about, I didn't think of the screw tape letters then, but I thought of that verse in James. It gave us the opportunity to talk about this very thing because he was sort of saying whenever there's misfortune that sometimes they'll, you might have a tendency to think I caused this. What could I have done differently? So the van didn't break down. Now we lost these many days. Right. And it's like, no, things just happen. It's not, it's not that you did something that it's your fault. And also those plans that we make, that's always, if we're forgetting to say, if God wills it. So, yeah, I thought that was one of yeah. the biggest, for me, biggest reminders in the book, that section. That takes me to actually probably my favorite quote from the book, uh, where Screw Tape is talking about one of his own patients uh, upon his, his arrival down in hell. When he said, um, on his arrival down here, I he found out that he had spent most of his life doing neither what he ought nor what he had liked. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, and whole section, yeah. And just talking, uh, yeah. Cause that was within that section where he was talking about how that's what the goal is, right. For people to feel like they're doing what, what they perceive to be the thing that they should be. But in reality, they're getting neither joy nor fulfillment from it, but rather just, they're just doing it to go by, go with the motions basically. Just and getting like, through like life instead get of living it. Exactly. Do you think that connects well with the recent statement that Elon Musk made 
uh, where he said that one of the things he's learned to despise now mm -hmm. are the people who uh, act as if they are good or seek to be seen as good, but do evil instead. And yeah. I, I think that's probably a, I, I think that, you know, when we look at the people who act that way, even at the upper echelons of wealth, I think that's probably a very substandard way of existing. I, I can't imagine there's much joy involved in that. Yeah. No. Zero. Well, right? and I think it was in letter 14, because I, I took some notes. I, I didn't write the exact phrase from the book, but there was there. The, it actually talked a little bit about what I what I took as virtue signaling and when he was talking about humility. So yes. the, <laughs> you try to be humble and then you fail, but then you take pride in the fact that you tried to be humble mm -hmm. and then you fail and it just keeps you just keep building yourself up higher by failing by saying, yeah, but I'm doing this to get to there. So, um, yeah. Oh, that was... that's such a funny part. He says, yeah, he says, if... I wish I had written down the quote. Oh, he, he basically says, you know, he's, he's castigating what his, his nephew is like, you know, you've, the, you've allowed the patient to develop actual humility. He's got humility now. Yeah. And he says the, what you should do is direct his attention to the fact that he has humility mm -hmm. so that if he notices it, if, if you notice that you have a virtue, not that you, he, there's another part where he's talking about don't have false humility where you pretend like you don't have gifts or you don't have certain talents or, or, or traits or, you know. Oh, can I piggyback on that? But, real quick? Yeah, yeah. You, one of my biggest things, like in ministry, someone will tell a minister a uh, good sermon today. And they like try to act like they can't say thank you because, you know, God gave them the sermon. And it's just it's such a to me, a false humility. I just say thank yeah. you. Thank you. Just say like, thank you. People yeah. want to hear thank you. Any, that's why they're saying a compliment. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like, yes, God, like, God helped. God, you know, gave you the inspiration, inspired you. But like at the end of the day, you wrote it down. Like there's nothing wrong with saying thank you. There's nothing wrong with it. That's what that's what is done. You you show that gratitude for that and acknowledgement. And that's it. I, I had to learn that lesson. uh when people gave me gifts in young adulthood, I was, I, I had, a um, my mother-in-law taught me, she was like, just say, thank you. Don't feel guilty. Or like, yes. I can't afford some, a gift at the same price or whatever, or some weird, like, I don't deserve this. Just say, thank you. <laughs> and like, yeah. it's so, it seems so simple when someone laid it out to me, like, duh, but yeah. Okay, For additional, so uh, for, for, for additional context, too, to why C.S. Lewis may approach it in that way, uh, reading Mere Christianity, his, his premise seems to be that pride is, in fact, sort of the starting point for most of the other sins or all of the other sins. His, his view yes. is that pride is the initial mistake and that pride is the subjugation of the divine to your own wills. And therefore, from that, then, is a well of all the other errors and mistakes and missing of the marks that we can do in life. Yes. And it's so easy for pride to, to creep up. And that example with the humility is so, it's so perfect. Cause he says, you know, now that your patient has developed humility, just show him that help him see he has humility because then hopefully he'll say, I have humility and take a little and yeah. take some pride in it and become prideful about the humility. And then if you, um, if, and, and then if he starts to, stumble again up is down down is up so stumbling mm -hmm. means means actually coming closer to god and realizing wow i've had pride about being humble yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like well then you just have to give him pride about noticing that he was having pride about me at least i'm one of the people exactly. who noticed and i like how know. he does add that a couple of times throughout throughout the uh throughout the book is <laughs> that injection of pride as, as kind of the antidote right so the antidote to grace is pride Right, because because then you take the grace that you've been given and it, you internalize it and and you, as you said, right, instead of it being you know thank you, it's it's a uh, oh well you know the Lord worked through me and it's all about me and it's mine 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 once again. So I just I do like how pride comes up several times where it's like almost this antidote to grace. He he gave a great example for anyone listening along who hasn't read it yet. I thought a great example of this was when he said, um, and I may get some of the details wrong because it was making me think about cathedrals but he may not have used the example of cathedral but he said let's say you let's say you're a great architect or something and you build a beautiful cathedral god doesn't want you to pretend like it's not a beautiful cathedral 
<laughs> or you had nothing to do with it. He just, he wants you to be equally happy. If Michelle is the one who built the be the beautiful cathedral, you, mm -hmm. he wants you to take joy in this beautiful cathedral that's been built and to celebrate it. And, and, but not to, um, he said it's almost as if to acknowledge you did it and you have the gift and then forget about it mm -hmm. <laughs> instead yeah, of on. walking around with this chip on your shoulder he does like, say that oh, yeah. i built that I, I also i remember like <laughs> underlining that too because it was like the the path of the enemy right is to be able to do something and, and to forget it basically i think that there was also the concept too of of sin right saying like that's how we need to make sure that they don't do this right for those that are repentant of their sin right because what god wants is for you to to accept that repentance and then move on right and then continue moving forward but the way that they would tempt them and the way that the fighter fight to fight against that is to try to keep bringing up right the past sins keep bringing up the past so that way they can never move on and forget well, and it goes back to also Odin, the, the concept of don't let your right, what, which hand, don't let your right hand know what your, know left, what your hand left hand does hands. or which, yeah. whichever hand, <laughs> you know, don't let it know, uh, basically just do it and move on. Mm -hmm. what, what do you all think of the idea that, uh, what, what would C.S. Lewis say today about the fact that we have an entire month where we have uh, memorialized and celebrated via the established corporations of the world and the governments of the world? The primary sin is, in his viewpoint is now a celebratory mark for an entire month and probably, at least in Canada Canada now, it's an entire season of celebrating, in his viewpoint, the oh, beginning yeah. of all sins. I can go on that one. So I, I kind of had a point all about that, Pro. Um, there's a whole letter where um, Screwtape's basically talking about how they've gotten us to the point where we shout out our sins and hide our piousness. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, he was he was basically prophetic about it because, I mean, look at look at everything that goes on now. Everybody is about shouting their sins. Everybody knows what everybody does wrong. Pride fest, sexual deviance, uh, the shout your abortion movement. Um, even on social media, people filming you know fights or actively setting up a fight so it can be filmed so that it can go on Instagram or on TikTok so that you get famous for doing something stupid. I mean. We prosecute the righteous while we, you know, while we're freeing the guilty at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, I, an I agree completely that. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Amazing point, Brahma, Brahmable. And, and I mean, let's add to that. We've lived into, we live in a culture now where they can make Christians feel, and Christians don't need to feel this way. We need to, to just buck against it. They make Christians feel like, shut up, be quiet. You don't share your faith. That's only for when you're in a church building. Stick, stay to yourself. Meanwhile, pride, let's dance in the streets. Let's have rainbow flags everywhere we go. And if, if and it, it's yes, and if they can be that way, why can't Christians be that way? Because only yeah. if you deny them do you become a hateful bigot. Yeah. <laughs> but my point, think the... my point is legally, there's nothing preventing it. And mm -hmm. like Christian, we don't need a self censor out of that fear. I also think that the iconography, the symbolism of, of the, the crucifixion of Christ, I think is, what would we say? It is so powerful um, to those who, who want to celebrate pride and other other vices and to shout them out and to use them for fame and all of that sort of thing. I think it's such a juxtaposition to look on ultimate suffering, uh, totally undeserved, but voluntarily taken in order to save those through pure compassion and love. That is such a powerful, I mean, the ultimate powerful symbol. It's, it's so powerful that it sits at the top of the mega myth or the monomyth in which every story attempts to somehow rise to the level of Christ, but never can. I think that, I think that Christ is offensive to, uh, to those who celebrate sin mm -hmm. because without saying a word, it calls out the, this is okay. I found it. It calls out to you that you are less than the potential that you should be yes. if you cast your eyes upon the divine. And so when you're out there, uh, you know, uh, celebrating the carnal and uh, you're celebrating the, uh, the, the, the mistreatment of youth, let's say that's the, I think that's the safest way I can put that. 
just the just the recognition of a God who would love love others to the point of of dying in a horrific way, totally undeserved to save you. I I think it's so potent in calling you forth out of what you're doing that they don't want to cast their eyes upon it. It it reminds me of uh, it reminds me of the story of of Moses and Moses even being the kind of person that he was uh, did not have the power to look upon the face of God. And yeah. I was on a uh, I was on a walk about a month ago, and we we talked about this in a member exclusive uh, video on my channel. Um, it's not really it's not really the sort of content that I would put out on the main channel because it's a little bit more esoteric. But uh, on my walk. The sun was positioned in just such a way that it, it had cast a reflection on the water. And as I walked over this bridge and looked at the water, um, I noticed that I was able for a short period of time to look on the water in the reflection of the sun. But I was not able to stare at the sun, of course. That would, you know, damage your eyes. But the reflection of it was just dimly, or just dim enough, but still so so vibrant and so powerful that you could look at it for just a little bit. And I thought, you know, that's, that's sort of what... Uh, people who truly live their life uh, aiming for the example of Christ are like. Yes. They're a reflection that you can just barely look at long enough. Whereas the, the symbolism of Christ is so powerful that for those who, who reject that ideal, and I don't think there's anything higher you can aim for than Christ. I don't think it matters if you're Christian or not. I think everybody knows that's the highest good there is. And so, I, I think that the best that we can do is what C.S. Lewis, I think, is calling us out in this to do, which is to not be dull and to be uh, uh, shadowy or, or uh, you know, neutral colored, but rather to be as vibrant as we can be, because the more vibrant you are in terms of good and altruism, then the more you're reflecting that light that does not come from within you, from but from something beyond. Well, and it, it's so, that's an excellent point. And, and going off of that, it's so sad. We live in a world, and I mean, this isn't new. It's been from the beginning. We live in a world that celebrates the unnatural. And by unnatural, I mean sin is actually, as natural as, as people want to act like sin is, sin is actually unnatural to how humans were created. We were created in God's image. Sin, sin, sin was a foreign element that entered in. Uh, and we live in a society, and this goes back to what Brahma Bull's quote that he brought, I mean, what he brought up earlier about our time, but also our bodies. Our bodies belong to God. And of course, I mean, him talking about that takes me to Romans. Uh, Present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable uh, unto God. It is our reasonable service. Um, we live in a society that wants to promote, basically do what thou wilt, thou will, uh, the, the satanic, basically, yeah. uh, what, what that church promotes. And we and one, that makes you miserable. And look at the depression rates and things yeah. rising in our society. But secondly, I, I was discussing with a friend, I might have said this on another panel here, I don't know. Almost all of the sins that like Paul list of the, th let's, we'll, we'll say the sins that are, don't do, you know, don't do these things, th that list of don'ts, uh, any of those things, any, th any of those things, if you do them, they harm the body. If you're an alcoholic, your liver is going to get destroyed. If you're very promiscuous, you might get a really bad STD. Uh, like you just can just keep going down the thing, like of how anything that destroys the body ultimately is a sin, typically, or almost always. And, and going back to why is that? And I think C.S. Lewis is hitting at that because our bodies, one, belong to God because literally God chose to inhabit our bodies. I mean, we we possess the, we in, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit uh, is inside all of God's children. And that's why, I mean, Paul goes through that, you know, don't join yourself to a, a harlot or a prostitute. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the most high God? Um, but yeah. Yeah. I think especially with that connection of, of saying that when it comes to sin, that, that it's an unnatural action. Yes. Right. Um, and that kind of goes back to what even in screw tape, right. We see of this continuous talk about, as I mentioned earlier, like the corruption of the virtues, because ultimately all sin is a corruption of a good. 
Um, yes. This kind of, you know, it's it's very fitting that this is dedicated to to Tolkien, right? Because you know, Tolkien is is known for in his in his book, right, having a, a moment where he says, right, that they um, that that evil itself can never create; it can only ever corrupt. Right. Yes. And so the evil in that world are all corrupted creatures. If you look at the uh, the orcs, if you look at all of just like the, the big bads, right, it's all this corruption. And so you look at our modern day and age and you think, OK, and he talks a little bit about this, too, when he talks about marriage in in the book as well, about how that what they try to do is they try to create this corruption of marriage, um, that they try to, to make it so that marriage is seen as an accessory um, so that people enter into it not through an actual genuine thought of self-sacrifice, but rather just going through the motions or for some other, um, yeah. you know, self-focused reason. And, and they want that because that is what, how they're able to continue, right? To have people just enter into marriages that are essentially guaranteed to fail. And basically how, like he talks about how, what they want to do is they want to have marriage viewed, not as uh, marriage is made for the two to become one flesh, and he even says, notice how it doesn't say good marriage leads to the two becoming one flesh, right? And so I think that that is an interesting aspect to this as well, of this corruption that, that sin is. Well, and that... I'm going off that, and then I will stop talking. Let someone else talk. <laughs> I love that he actually hit on that when he got on the issue, the subject of sex. Mm -hmm. Because one of okay, so the devil is, as he says at the the beginning of the book, readers are advised to know, remember that the devil is a liar. <laughs> um, one of the biggest lies that has been gone out from the beginning of time, and there's a reason why a lie gets so big. I think I think there's power behind that because clearly the enemy is behind that lie. One of the biggest lies I've seen throughout my life is sex does not affect men. And while I will agree sex impacts women a little more emotionally, it is a lie from the pit of hell that sex does not have an impact on men. Literally in scripture, for those of you who believe in scripture, sex was designed, there's a spiritual tie that happens. The two become one flesh and men can think that that doesn't bother them all they want but that's just not a spiritual truth. Literally, there is a connection made on a spiritual level that can't just easily be broken. And you yeah, can see this. Book is... go, ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, you can see this in all around you in culture because mm -hmm. we've all known or maybe been someone um, in a relationship where you, uh, if you grow up according to culture, which says you can separate sex from from love and marriage and everything feelings and emotion um you may have ended up in a relationship with someone you now have feelings for who's a crazy person because <laughs> you bonded with them in that way <laughs> like not good mm -hmm. yeah. but he also Which is what the quote it. go ahead oh well i was just going to read the quote from the book that specifically mm -hmm. says that uh, the truth is that wherever a man lies with a woman there, whether they like it or not, a transcendental relation is set up between them, which must must be eternally enjoyed or eternally endured. Yes. Endured. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to take a second. If like we, a trial. If we can. <laughs> um, I just, I want to read some of these super chats quickly because I feel bad. People think I'm going to miss them. And we'll do them quickly. Uh, K-Dub Trues here. Hello, sir. We want to have you on one of these panels. I know um, if we can make it work with your work schedule. If you guys haven't checked out KW True, please do. He's got a great channel called All Things Theology. Um, okay, we are also uh, simulcasting tonight. I think we're on t two channels tonight, my, mine and Force of Light. So all the super chats, you can they all appear here, but you can do it on Michelle's channel. Uh, Miss Martin Muses for 99 cents sent a super sticker. I can't see what it is. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Miss Martin Muses. She has a great channel also talking a lot about uh, faith as well. Yes. Oh. Hey, Brett. Do you want to read this one? Oh, wait. he just says hi, everyone. Sorry. Hi, <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> Member for five months. Uh, let's see. I recognize some of you folks. KB gifted one Force of Light Entertainment membership. Thank you Thank so you. much. And 
here, this Michelle, this one's for you. Read this one. And Brett, thank you so much for the $5 super chat. Someday you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again. Yeah. I love that from the Chronicles of Narnia, the preface to it. Yep. Uh, Raider. Raider's the man. $50. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you for the very generous support. And then WG gifted 5D program memberships. Thank you, WG. Good to see you again. Uh, and then I had one question. I don't know the answer to this, but maybe someone on the panel does. Tolkien led C.S. Lewis to faith, right? Or was it the other way around? That one, I'm not sure. Both had, because like, the main thing that I know about them, because I'm not an expert on, on their relationship, was that Tolkien was was kind of always like trying to you know kind of pull him in the direction of of the Catholic Church? But what's interesting is that one of the reasons why he who was never because if you read the work right, I think that the the type of Anglican that C.S. Lewis was, I don't know, I don't know honestly if it even exists in in today's world because it's such a high church like high theology uh, Anglicanism which I, I don't really know exactly whether or not that that really is around anymore because I'm, I'm not as familiar with it. But what's interesting is that for him, and he's, he has, there's several quotes associated with him, said one of the primary reasons why he never switched over other than some you know, general disagreements was likely influenced by the fact that he grew up in, was it Northern Ireland, where uh, basically he experienced, uh, or he grew up in an area where he experienced this, this, this animosity between Catholics and Protestants. And so he mm -hmm. saw this ugly side of of that. And so because he was raised with that with that understanding and that mindset, it kind of influenced him the rest of his life, too. I, you know, today we were at a antique shop here in uh, Lubbock and I saw my husband saw this book. It was C.S. Lewis early journals from mm -hmm. when he was very young and an atheist. Um, and I was thinking, oh, this is going to be so interesting. Maybe I should have bought it. I decided against it because I flipped through it and it, it wasn't anything about the state of being or any, it was just literally, it seemed to be a recounting of his day. Like Mr. Perkins came over and we had tea and I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I, it would be interesting to know more about what he was thinking about at that period of his life. Definitely. Um, Okay, where should we pick up? I have a I have a couple notes on some of the, the great things you guys were saying. Well, there, there was one thing that I wanted to say, and I want to say it carefully because um, when we were on the topic of sex, we left that, I think, in an unfinished place that mm -hmm. needs uh, a redemptive addition to it. Okay, and that is that I there agree. may be there may be some out there who are listening listening who have had times in their life in which they lived in a promiscuous way. Uh, or they've had failed marriages and they feel very condemned uh, often by, you know, try again, looking at the, the uh, looking at the representation of Christ and, and realizing that you come short of the divine and we all come short of the divine and we all have our own areas in which we fall short of that ideal. And so that's why all of us find ourselves lacking. But just for those who have uh, had times in their life where in that particular area, they feel that they have fallen short and they're looking for a way to uh, feel their full value again, I would just remind people that in, that in uh, John chapter 4, Jesus speaks to the, the Samaritan lady at the well, and he knows the truth about her when she says something that is not all the way sufficiently true, and he tells her that she has had, I believe, five husbands, and the man that she is currently with is not her husband. That said, that's not the end of the story because she comes to believe in Jesus, and uh, I believe that later in that story, she is the one who goes to the Samaritans around and tells yeah. them all and mm -hmm. leads them to belief in uh, Christ as the Messiah. And so I think it's worth pointing out that Jesus knows that we are all broken vessels, that none of us is in a state of, of purity. Uh, we all have issues that we come to the table with, and yet he chooses to use us nonetheless. And so I would suggest to those out there who, who may feel less than that uh, you're exactly the kind of person that uh, God calls you to be uh, and not to let the past hold you back from that. 
yeah to move forward Absolutely. and to to recognize that love kind of also yes. connects a lot to the uh you know the the story of the woman caught in adultery right mm -hmm. does no one condemn you neither do i go and what do not sin again and i think it's like that's something that sometimes it's the hard thing to do is to accept god's forgiveness but with the recognition that there there is a there's that catch right which is that the only cost right is that we that's repentance odin Exactly. Right. It's like the only cost I always, I, I describe this to my students and I say, you know, grace, right. It's a free spiritual gift and there is a cost to it though. It's free, mm -hmm. but I like to put a little asterisk next to it because basically it's hand, it's God's hand out for you, but guess what? You need to grab it. It's like an unopened mm -hmm. present, present, whatever is inside. Grace is a great gift, but that gift can't do anything until you open the box, take it mm -hmm. out and utilize it in your own life. And I think that kind of connects back to what um, you're saying is that moving forward and also what we talked about earlier with what he said about how the demons try to keep people from being able to to move forward and forget um and instead to linger on on past mistakes and the yeah. the another the epitome another, another of that of course would be david mm -hmm. yeah, well, ahead, david's bro. a great example but the, the the uh the prodigal son um mm -hmm. yes you know in, in in under the jewish belief system and the kosher laws uh, you know, sleeping with pigs. There's nothing more unclean than that, and that's mm -hmm. what that's what Christ uses as the example of how God views humanity. Is that uh, when you go and you do the most abhorrent things possible, He still waits for you to return. But He doesn't. He doesn't come to you to to draw to drag you kicking and screaming out of the mud pit with the pigs. You have to take those steps to return back. But once you do arms are open wide and you are a beloved child. And mm -hmm. I, I can't remember the exact verse or exactly how it said, but um, if you can love your children in that way, how much more does God love you? Yes. yes. It's yeah. also, it's like that verse about how uh, you guys correct me. I'm going to get it wrong. But even if one sheep goes missing, the shepherd mm -hmm. will go. Look, we'll leave the him. 99 to go get the one. Yeah. And which is which is funny because if you actually look to, if you actually were to ask any shepherd, they would say you're crazy. They'd be like, I'm not even my flock because it's not it's not and it's not any shepherd. It's the good shepherd. That's right. Yeah. The good shepherd is the one who will go out and 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 go to get the one lost. And so that's again, he's, he's using this example. But I imagine any shepherd listening to him or anyone who knows that would have said, well, that would have immediately had thought about that, saying, wait a minute, shepherd wouldn't do that. But that's why he talks about it as the good shepherd. Yes. Dion, the queen of quotes is here. She has a C.S. Lewis quote that's very appropriate for this part. She says, I think that if God, uh, I think that if God forgives us, we must forgive ourselves. Otherwise, it's almost like setting up ourselves as a higher tribunal than him. Mm. Yes. Goes back to that pride, right? That mm -hmm. that we're so sometimes that the pride can be injected into us. It's, as I said, it's that antidote to grace. In, in a way, because even though we've received that forgiveness, our pride will not allow us to be forgiven sometimes. Yeah. Yes. And it, it, that, that quote makes me think of uh, Paul in Romans eight. Uh, there is, there's, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I wanted to go back for a second, if I can, um, to, uh, your question, WDW Pro. I always want to say WD40. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't get out the second. I w keep the ever. wheels turning. <laughs> I trip all over it. You keep the wheels turning. That's right. Um, your question about a whole our current culture and you know having a whole month that's called Pride and how many? Right, that's, that's that is the sin of uh, Lucifer, right? That's the right. That's the sin of the devil himself. And yeah, it made which... me think. It, well, just really quickly, it made me yeah, think of ahead. this, this, uh, this part that I highlighted today because it it stood out to me, where he's talking about fashions, and what they what is culturally fashionable at any given time, and he says we the demons, you know, we make we make it fashionable to criticize the things that you know it's not you don't have to be brave to criticize those things. And they're already out, like they're it's like in a particularly lascivious time, let's make it fashionable to criticize purity um, yes. and to ignore the things that are the biggest current dangers and to celebrate those things. 
And so it's the exact opposite. He said it's almost like if a, if you imagine a boat that ha it has a hole in it and is sinking, we want them all lined up with fire extinguishers mm -hmm. um, on the part of the boat that's that's sinking. And it, it I thought that illustration was great, but it I think that's sort of what you're talking about because this current culture, you have all these celebrities, you have all these people who who go out there and they take a stand and they make a statement on, for example, on behalf of pride, you know, you have corporations doing it and it's supposed to be supposedly we're all being gaslit that it's, it's some brave stance. It's the Aren't you looking forward thing. to Walmart and Target celebrating depravity month now? Every July? <laughs> right. And it's brave and it's so, but they're, it's not brave. It's the fashionable thing. Mm -hmm. It would be brave to, to celebrate purity, chastity. Um, that Temperance, would be prudence, you know, exactly yeah, the virtues. Yeah. In that same part, uh, Carrie, like he was saying that basically turn it into his life. Now that he has faith, now that he's found this faith, you need to twist it to turn it into Christianity end, right? Christianity end yes. this Christianity end that. Right. And he says this word to introduce the concept of novelty as pleasure, right? We're with the new fashionable thing. And that's what's most important. Focus not on whether something is good, but rather if it's progressive, rather if it's something I just the way that he was wording that I thought was just very insightful yeah. into what we see in our modern day, right? That's why you do see there are these Christian churches. And, and I say this very, very loosely, who have the <laughs> creed to the binary, non-binary God, right? And the sparkle creed and these like, there's so many things where you're like, this is not Christianity in any yeah. way. Yeah, it's he I like that part because he says something about how the enemy, meaning God, likes he wants man to ask himself more simple questions like, is this righteous? Mm -hmm. Is this moral? Is this good? Is this wrong? And the way that we keep man from thinking about those very deep, meaningful things, which are simple questions, though, is to give him complicated questions that seem so i don't know it seems so intellectual you know and and that's how you get stuff like in my little town georgetown a, tr a non-binary pastor doing a sermon about queering christianity and the patriarchy and stuff and it's like you know you're using all these academic words and you're asking you're asking of man these overly complicated questions because it, you're obscure you're obscuring what's really important is this good? There's, there's a way to have a party without food and family and call it Thanksgiving, but it doesn't really ring true. And I would say that's <laughs> probably the same for the uh, church service that you're speaking of there. Yeah. You you can have you can have a Christian church that doesn't have Christ and doesn't have virtuous teachings and uh, adopts all of the language that is counter and outer to uh, Christianity. But then I, I think you may be playing a game of semantics only at that point. Yeah. Yep. Oh, one other quick thing. And then I'm, and then I'm going to stop talking. This makes me think of a, there was one quote that I wrote down. Um, it was something about, Oh, nonsense. This is it. Ah, oh, this is, it, I think it was Thomas soul is the one who said something about some ideas are so stupid. Only an intellectual could believe them. And, <laughs> um, and I thought I of that, with, that after that uh, interview in Congress with the Harvard and uh, uh, the others who were talking about uh, issues to do with Israel. I don't know if you all saw that, but I, I believe that yeah. now. Yeah. This is the we'll quote be talking from, about that in about an hour. Uh, from Screw Tape that I that I thought of, or made me think of the Thomas Sullivan. Nonsense, nonsense in the intellect can reinforce corruption in the will. Like mm -hmm. he's saying, mm -hmm. we want nonsense in the in, in the human's intellect, nonsense lodged there to back up and reinforce any corruption in their will and their desire, mm -hmm. and that's so that's like it's almost like um it's almost like the righteous mind which is a book i talk about a lot i love that book um where where jonathan Haidt talks about our emotional mind and our rational mind and we all like to think we lead with the ration or the intel the, the the intellect but actually that's just what we use a lot of the time to back up what our will wants or what our desire wants so i don't know if that yeah, makes sense. the rational mind from, was uh... always winning we'd be a lot thinner <laughs> <laughs> True. before we move away from the uh sex and marriage portion of the talk of the book i did want to just kind of 
I in this read through, I kind of brought through a whole bunch of the stuff that actually applies to today as I was reading it. So, I mean, the, the demons trying to redefine love as love is sexual attraction mm -hmm. rather than love is hard work to actually make a marriage work. I, I look at it today with the whole love is love movement and trying to destroy the nuclear family. I mean, love is very hard. Marriage is very hard. So I just wanted to hit on that a little bit because, I mean, he's talking about the demons who are constantly trying to redefine what love actually is to a human. And it's still being redefined constantly today. Yeah. And yeah. that's why I had mentioned earlier, right? Because he speaks of the corruption of marriage not to be viewed as lifelong um, because marriage, and he, that's why he says marriage, not happy marriage makes two into one flesh. Right. But then also within that same context, right, it does speak a lot to the demons in that they can't understand love because they cannot understand. That's like one of the frustrations that you see uh, Screwtape have is he doesn't understand the concept of self-sacrificing love, mm -hmm. right? And, and so in order to, because there is not that understanding, how do you corrupt it? I, I also really liked in that same section, he says, we need to move man's uh, desires away from marriage, Right, because and this is something that we have done very well is make it so that man cares more about secondary traits, right? So that man and woman care about. So that's why at one point, it's like like a beard uh, is now seen as unattractive amongst uh, many women, right? And the body types oh. are at this point. Um, and at one point as well, as saying you know now we're at this age where you know man uh, desires woman who who is more similar to to a young child, uh, so that they always want to make sure that they never get old. Right. The fear of growing old is, is always there. Um, and so the way that they corrupt that is by making man uh, focus more so on infernal. The infernal Venus is how he describes it. And he also at one point uses the word uh, as a tang. It was used as like he's talking about prostitutes, basically. Oh. Saying like, that man yeah. has this like this, this, like, this desire for certain, certain things. But then there's like this dark side that we're going to try to push on a little bit to have, you know, to desire this tang, this tangy uh, desire that's within them. <laughs> Well, and on that same section, uh, I called it the flapper dress section because when he was talking <laughs> about the fashion of, of the flapper dress and women, the current trend was to try to make women look, you know, more more boyish. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a that is not a reasonable, you know, thing because it's, it's it can be natural. But the way, you know, people were trying to do it was a bit unnatural, trying to have that body type that some people have but i mean we talk about how you know the fashion constantly is changing and what i got from that part you know it just i i got a little bit of it i think from a talk ben shapiro did a while ago specifically about this section of the book translates basically to the to internet porn mm -hmm. constantly having these shifting things that you know men are men are supposed to want and women are tr supposed to try to emulate mm -hmm. and they're not natural or the way it's supposed to be and what's how it's warping right people's now? minds what's the biggest thing associated with this right now only fans right yeah. yeah and like how many not only are men on this platform but how many women now are being drawn to this like you have people literally who give up their careers because they recognize oh i can make more money if i sell my body and mm -hmm. by proxy yep. sell my soul and i yeah absolutely think there's a lot of connections to be made i don't think that we have and it will take a very long time to appreciate how dramatically we have altered the psychology of the human race yeah. uh, via uh, pornography on the internet because mm -hmm. uh the experience of of learning about those uh those encounters with others and the limited nature that that would have been for, naturally for anyone a uh, hundred, two hundred, a thousand years ago, and even with the decrease in population, you know the, the number of people that you would have interacted with is dramatically smaller. And our brains are probably not wired at all uh, for what this new paradigm is. And uh, you know, it's kind of like it's kind of like a, a, a constant flow of of uh, processed sugar into the bloodstream. That, that probably doesn't scale well with the body. And I think it's the same thing when there's a constant feed of uh, what would have been unimaginable to our ancestors. And so that, uh, that constant, constant hit that people are getting, I think, is also, and, and especially, too, at a very young age, I think is warping the ability to form 
intimate bonds, period. Uh, and I think that's I think that's going to have a dramatic influence and impact over all of society over the next hundred years. I think we don't have a clue what we've unleashed. Oh, Absolutely. I think I think it already yeah. has. Yeah, yeah. Marriages, but I don't think like, I don't think we know the ramifications. Yeah, generations well, then, experiencing yeah. that, and then virtual reality is going to take that to also an entirely new domain that we don't know what to do with yet. We don't yeah, even I think know. We, we won't know the fullness of it, but I think we are definitely seeing some ramifications. Like, you know, if you look at the, the divorce rate, for instance, mm -hmm. um, if you look at the vast majority of divorces, there's almost always going to be a mention of a porn addiction by the, the husband in that marriage. So we're already seeing it completely corrupt and destroy uh, marriage itself. And, and I think that it's, it's influencing, of course, the earlier relationships right earlier on within that relationship right now relationships are even more sexualized than they were before the number of people that live together you know cohabitate the number of people that have sex before marriage right has gone up skyrocket and we're seeing all of these things are interconnected and and we're seeing all of these things have impacts on on marriages all, all around you're also seeing escalating um, um statistically escalating rates of erectile dysfunction in younger aged mm -hmm. men um yeah. which you didn't used to see in younger men and because it actually gets to something screw tape ta talks about in this book where he says where he's talking about novelty mm -hmm. and if you make novelty the ultimate end then they're constantly chasing what is new and and not rhythmic right but uh, but completely novel then you get them on this path where they're just they chase that to depravity um and i don't think he used the word depravity that's how i heard it in my head <laughs> but um but that's what I think happens with a lot of what you guys are talking about when you're talking about uh, pro the online porn is that right mm -hmm. is that it left you know the magazine racks and it it entered this device that you got 24 7 attached to your hand with any and all kinds of 24 hour accessible always new and different kinds and people end up becoming um, desensitized to it, much like an addict to alcohol, you have to drink more to get the same buzz. You're always chasing mm -hmm. that first high where then people uh, go into more and more taboo stuff until they're just not even able to function with a real person, you know, with their spouse or, um, and so- Also the evil gets corrupted. Like what starts yeah. off as maybe they're watching something that would be typical, then they get into something that's atypical and then they get to something where you know, it's, 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 it's illegal. I, again, the, like the, the, yeah. and I think yeah. that he also talks about that too, saying that this is not a race, right? This is, or that this is not a sprint, right? Saying that this is something that we have to cultivate over time. And we see the same thing happen with various types of sins. And I think this is, I think one of the biggest sins that no one's talking about and that no one is really, you know, speaking up uh, loudly about it, just have of how much of a negative impact it's having. Somebody had a question and women don't want porn. Actually, if you look at the statistics of porn consumption, it is increasing among women. It has been steadily for, I think, I think about a decade, but it's not the same. It's not at the same level as men, yeah. but. Um... Yeah. Okay, and what... again, again, going back to the idea of like porn is unnatural. Like, I mean, the way God designed it, like you should see your spouse naked and that really should be it. Like, but with porn, it can just be endless people, endless amounts. Like, it's just, it's unnatural and unnatural things pervert, twist uh, our thinking and really just our being. And it really is just kind of like Romans 1 where you just keep going in a downward spiral and our society is there right now. Like yeah. how it's kind of like, how low can we go? How deprived can we get as a society? Yeah. I, I do the things I do not want to do. Yes. Right. Um, and, and, and also just kind of picking backing off of that a little bit. We, we see this, this, again, this, just this, as you mentioned, the corruption, because, you know, and they talk about this a lot too, in the book where pleasure, right. Pleasure is seen as such a good thing because by itself, right. Pleasure is a good thing. And so that's why when you see something and you think that you like it in regards to something like, like porn, for instance, it's because there is something good there. There is something beautiful there, but it's been so twisted that now you're viewing it in such a way that, that you're falling and you don't even realize it, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're feeling that, that instant high, that instant pleasure, but then you're, you're losing the fact that you've just cor like, you're corrupting uh, your soul over that, that extended period of time. And eventually you go down this rabbit hole. And we've seen just, again, so many accounts 
of just how depraved this can be. But again, it all goes back to that corruption. But there's that, again, there is such, there is that goodness, right? And that's why, you know, in the church's perspective, there's always this, this uh, understanding, and I think that it's probably by members of the church too, of, you know, that, that sex is viewed as this bad thing. It's like, no, sex is such a good, beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're so drawn to it. But if we're not drawn to it in the right way, that's when it becomes this this problem we see and that starts to hurt us and our relationships that's that's that chapter or two that he did about pleasures where like you were saying earlier mm -hmm. odin we as demons we can't create the pleasures you know god created the pleasures but we can corrupt the pleasures and he was saying you know humans if they when they enjoy pleasures in a health or healthy and proper context you know that that god intended that they're that they're under the the will of the creator of God. They're, they're with our enemy, but mm. it's when they start to enjoy them in unhealthy ways or don't practice, you know, temperance or chastity that that's when it starts to harm them. And that's when they're being pushed closer to our father, our father. And that's well, the strength he, he says that he has, right. right? Because the line he says is he cannot, right. Talking about God, he cannot tempt to virtue as we do to vice. Right. That the power the demon has is that they can tempt with the vice, right, with the corruption, whereas virtue, mm -hmm. it's something that really can't be tempted with because virtue requires you to to act in such a way that it's it's a, it's almost uncomfortable. Right. Because you're creating that good habit. And so that's the that's the one advantage that they have is that they can tempt you with with the vice, whereas in the case of God, at least what we see from here is that it can't be tempted with virtue. Do you guys let have me, uh, Go ahead. let me broaden this out? Um about the uh, online pornography issue. Let me, uh, let me decouple it for a moment from the Christianese and, and move it into the realm of behavioral psychology. Because uh, my viewpoint is that Christianity is logical. And mm -hmm. so I think the tenets of Christianity are logical. And so when we're talking about uh, the issues of, of online pornography and uh, uh, the abuse therein, I, I think that that's connected to a rationality that's undeniable for people no matter what side of the, you know, the equation you might be on. And so the way I would broaden that out for people listening who might be interested, but, but uh, feel a bit squeamish about the theology, or maybe they don't want to delve into the Christianity side of it. And they say, well, this is, feels a little religious for me. Uh, it feels a little prudish. Uh, imagine, if you will, that your mobile device had the capacity to instantly produce a giant decadent chocolate cake with the press of a button. Okay. And you, you begin to eat the chocolate cake every day or every night or whenever. And there came a point where no longer did you desire the chocolate cake because it wasn't enough anymore. And so then you moved on to something else. Let's say it was the ultimate decadent cheesecake or it was the ultimate decadent uh, ribeye or whatever it was. And every day, just with the press of a button, you could have this and you formed an addiction to that and you formed a, a pattern of behavior. You would, you would create a very unhealthy relationship with food just by doing that. And not only that, but you would you would cause yourself to be in a tremendous state of physical decay. You would you would be morbidly obese. You would have diabetes. You would have all kinds of ailments. And what I would suggest to people is that in forming appropriate human relationships, that that the sexual realm that's that's the pinnacle of this of the the relational uh, aspect of being human and finding someone that you're going to completely share yourself with. And so. That's like going into that realm. You you can't detect necessarily, although you did bring up ED, and that's and and, and you know uh, uh, fine with that. But it's not so easy to detect the the ailment in terms of human connectivity versus seeing someone who's gained five hundred pounds, mm -hmm. and yet it's just as important and just as destructive if you have done something to yourself which has caused you to have a dramatically askewed view of how to treat others there's there's a um, i'll give you an example of that uh, there's a, a, a prolific youtuber that there was a documentary done i'm not going to name the name and I, some of you will already know who i'm talking about i see odin smile down there uh <laughs> the youtuber spent tons and tons and tons and tons of fortunes on hiring people, escorts, right? Hiring women to do things. And no one looks up to that individual, right? Nobody, there's nobody out there who's, who looks at that and sees that as what they wish to emulate. And I would suggest that that 
that repulsion, that revulsion that we feel when we see people doing such action, I think that's an intrinsic uh, marker for all of us to know that that's not the way that you should go. And I would recommend that, you know, if every single day you're eating the chocolate cake and that's that's no longer sufficient, so you've moved to the cheesecake and that was no longer sufficient, so now you're just now you're just eating pure lard. I don't know well, what could be worse. I'm Crisco. trying to think what's worse than lard. <laughs> Crisco, you know, Crisco in the IV. Uh, and, and you get it by clicking the phone, then you're in a very unhealthy place. And uh, it's time to take some action to reset your patterns of behavior. It, it, if it was food, we would all know that you were doing that. But because it's, not, because it's not detectable in the same way, you might get away with it in terms of people instantly knowing it when they come across you. But it's, it's damaging your ability to interact with others. But And if you're married... Or otherwise, well, a in a relationship, yes, that's a different story. your partner will know. That's correct. Um, because it will affect that relationship. Uh, right. But yes, you can hide that from other people. And there are other addictions. I was just thinking about your example, Pro, of the the chocolate cake. and the, the My pastor had a sermon once where he was saying, again, about how beautiful all the pleasures are that God has given us. But he said the problem with sometimes with envy um, is that people, they, it's not that they have desires. It's that they set their desires so low and they settle for s such trash. Yeah. The trash wasn't his word. Maybe, Again. I, maybe, maybe my analogy and should have started off with McDonald's. Exactly. <laughs> it's sort of what you're saying. He was like, you know, it's like trading. Um, it, it's basically saying, you know, I want the, uh, yeah, give me the Big Mac. And then you don't get the steak because you chose the Big Mac, um, because you don't know what that that nicer thing is that God has for you. But you, but you, you clicked your you phone at 3 a.m. and got 300 yes. Big Macs. Yes, because you keep settling for this. But and, it's um, harder to pay for the steak. Yeah. That's and going to take work. That's going to take work. And I also saw a meme. You, you have to sacrifice that thing that you know, that habit. This meme of a little girl. You may have seen this. is a cartoon. And she's got a little a stuffed teddy bear. And Jesus is, is saying, um, you know, just, just give it to me. And she's like mine, but you can't see behind Jesus's back. He has a giant teddy bear. <laughs> I mean, it's just such a, it's a simple illustration mm -hmm. just to show you that, like, you don't know what that more beautiful gift is, that blessing that you're going to have, but you, but you're still holding on to this thing that, you know, I say this as someone who, um, you know, has, has, I, I chose that trash thing many times in life. And um, giving up drinking, for example, that was very hard to do. It felt like a sacrifice. I think I called it sacrificing a demon because it was my crutch. But it got to that place that Screw Tape talks about here, where you keep chasing it so much that it it's not even a pleasure anymore. It was, and you're trying to get back to that, but it's not anymore. It's just a habit now. And you hate that you do it. And you go through periods of like, I want to quit, but you're owned by it now. You are a slave to it now. Mm -hmm. And um, what was that thing you said, Brahma, the quote you like so much? I spent my life doing things. I, I what oh. was it? Yeah. Um, he got to hell and found that he had spent his whole life doing not the things that he ought to or the things that he had liked. Or the things he liked. Because mm -hmm. eventually you get to that place where you don't like it anymore. Um. I don't know if and that makes sense. I, I yeah. think we I might think have, have to outro to go, Odin. Oh, Odin, yeah. I'm so, I forgot. <laughs> oh, no, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, but I did, because kind of like also connecting to this uh, topic as well, um, you know, at one point, it's my favorite part so far, is he's mentioning the woman who's now in the human's life. And he's he's implying that he he does not like her very much because I was like, oh, it's the, the worst kind it could possibly be. And it's implying and, and even mentioned saying it's because she's a virgin. Right. And so it's like mm. it's demonized in this way where it's like, oh, she's a virgin. And so I just love it because he goes goes off on this tangent. Like, oh, the, the, the little brute is how is how he <laughs> describes her. And then the best quote, uh, you know, butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. It was one of the. <laughs> I was like, oh, this part. But it's true. Right. Because that that's something that clearly right. Demons w would absolutely hate is the concept of virtue and virtue, not just in the sense of habit, but virtue as far as being a virtuous person, right? To be a, a, a holy and pure person. Um, blessed are the clean of heart, right? What does it mean to have a clean heart? It means that your heart is united to the will of God, that your will is united to God's will. 
And that is one of the hardest things that we can do, especially when it comes to this, because that that vice is so tempting. However, as I think the example of the teddy bear, right, makes sense. It's like, yeah, but that's just a small teddy bear, right? If you're willing to make the sacrifice and if you're willing to to to, to do the work, the large teddy bear. You have no idea what that is. Well, I'm I'm. Um, thank you for for being with us, Odin. I'm sorry I kept you a little long. That's Odin okay. Thank you so much. And as always. Pro also have to leave. Um, both of you guys have to leave. So why don't you just tell people just very quickly where they can find you? These are some of the best people on the internet on YouTube. So go and follow them if you're not already. Um, Odin, where can people find you? You can find me at OMB Reviews on YouTube, Odyssey, Rumble, on uh, Twitter, and thank you as always for. Uh, for, thank you for you know, getting this group together because I, again I just love these talks so much and if, if I didn't had if I hadn't had told my wife saying oh yeah we're gonna get up at this time I, I would be staying on uh, <laughs> longer because I, I love these kinds of conversations but thank you as always thank you sir all right have a good one everybody <laughs> good to see you Odin. Bye. hi and uh, I want to say really quick going off what Odin said we now have um we now have through the manosphere, uh, something disguised as virtue of men find a virgin, but you live as a pig. Oh gosh. <laughs> you know, cause a virgin wants a man who's got a hundred people he slept with, you know, that's the way the world works. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder how people recycle such stupid ideas and there's still, there's a market for us. It. Like this idea is so old and dumb. <laughs> I, don't like, I don't know. Pro do you, you have to take off now, don't you? I do. I hope that I'm uh, not old and dumb, but uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> folks, if you'd like to find out if I am or not, check out my content on the WDW Pro channel, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time and 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time each and every day. And I suspect that I might be able to confer upon you that I'm at least average in the intellect department. Who knows? Maybe slightly below, but I'll do my best for you. We'll give you a compliment. You're very smart and <laughs> easy to listen to. And I, you just had your 50... Uh, 50,000 celebration stream, right. right? Congratulations. As yeah. Michelle has taught me today, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're, welcome. You're welcome. Good job. <laughs> All right, everybody, take care and have a wonderful evening. I hope you have a meaningful conversation going forward. And thank you so much for having me aboard. Thank yes, you, thanks for joining. Good night. Have a great night. And Carrie, off of what you said, it's funny. Now let's get this party going. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you mentioned the 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 picture. I've seen that. Na that's touched Natalie so many times. That little girl, like, give, you know, with the teddy the bear, teddy bear. So scared to give it. It's uh, such a simple way of explaining it. It is. And, and a quote, I had to stop, rewind, and write it down. Because, it again, it was one of those moments that just really touched me. He said, he, speaking of God, he will always give back with his right hand what he has taken away with his left. Yes. And I have found that to be very true. Like it, it may not happen immediately, but if you will freely give yourself and give those things to God, God will give back and even more so what you thought was a sacrifice to yes. give to God. That has been my experience so far. All the way up to your life. Yes. I mean, his yes. death may be a bad thing. He's taken your life away from you. But if your reward is heaven, I that was actually part of what I saw in the death of the patient in the book. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that is Lewis's answer to why do bad things happen to good people? Mm -hmm. Because he has the whole section about um, basically you've got to keep him alive so that he can continue to be tempted. You can't let this guy die. And, you know, basically the the bad things that are happening. I mean, it pushes you more towards God. If, if you're seeking God, bad things yes. can also, you can come out of them and be angry about it. Um, and go the other way, which is what the demons were hoping was going to happen. But even unto death, you know, that reward is there. If you continue to seek God. Yes. There was one part that also really struck me and it's, it's related to this one, to this Brahma, because you were saying even in the bad times you, or bad things happening to good people, for some people, that's going to push them closer to God. And it was the chapter, it was early on, it was the chapter about troughs that you go through or like the dark periods, the periods of disappointment. And then he, he said, 
he's explaining to the younger demon, you know, don't get all excited just because he's going through a period of depression and disillusionment. Like humans right. are defined by undulating through peaks and valleys. And um, it, sometimes they don't know this and they, they'll think it's never going to end, you know, this, this valley. And he said, but um, he was, he was basically talking about sometimes it's actually bad for us as demons when they're going through a dark time, because that's when they might come more quickly to rely on God and get closer to the enemy, to God. And I, this just, I started crying. It, I was laughing because I was thinking, Michelle, how many videos have we done now where you and I cried at the movie or whatever? And I'm like, I even cried at the book. I didn't think it was a cry at the book, but, <laughs> but it made me cry because it was like, that's so true that, you know, any hard time that you've gone through is an opportunity for, for, the to be to be drawn closer to god who just wants a closer relationship with you and sometimes i find myself praying when things are good like right now things are relatively good for me in my life and i'm like but i had a, some bad times last year so when this year i'm like i find myself um trying to like oh if i pray the right way and with the right you know that part of the book where he's talking about praying and then getting the right you think the prayer worked if you have the right feeling afterwards, which is yeah. a problem if you're doing that. Right. But I'll find myself doing that sometimes. Like I got to do the right things. I want to stay in. It's not entirely wrong what I'm doing. I, I should stay in communication with God. I should be reading scripture. I should be praying every day. But um, but sometimes I do it almost because I, I can tell I'm trying to. I don't want to have to go through a hard time again. I want to stay right here with you so I don't have to go through another hard time so that I, to get closer to you. Right. And. And then that's just made me cry because it made me realize like you have to go through those hard times. Yes. I can't avoid it by doing all the right things. I can't avoid it. I'm going to go through these hard times again. And it's beautiful. It's because God loves me. It's like discipline. It's like Hebrews 12. He's disciplining the children. He, he loves. loves the chastens. Yes. Yeah. Or chastise. I took from it or no. a dangerous world is needed to force people to seek and find uh, God. To seek and find the reason behind what's going on. Well, so if, if you lived in a perfect world, there'd be no reason to be there'd be no reason to be asking for redemption. Yeah. So you need a dangerous world to force that, to force yourself to see that and to seek what the the higher power that you know is behind all of it. And not all of that is a not all of that is nice things. No. Yes. Well, and Carrie, you saying that, it makes me think, I don't know if you've ever heard, if you have it, you need to fix it after the stream. If you've never heard the song, Andre Crouch's song, Through It All, uh, he, says, he says in that, if I never had a problem, I would never know my God could solve them. I would never know what faith in his word could do. Through it all. And, and it goes into the main chorus. I love that. I will, I will look it up. It, it will bring tears to your eyes. <laughs> Andre Crouch was special. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, that's, I don't know, that was just kind of an epiphany I had. And then, you know, my prayer that night was like, help me remember this thing that I learned so I don't have to learn that again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to forget this. Yes, but, that, uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of what my, my mom would say, you don't take another lap around the mountain, you know, referring back to the children of Israel. Just circling the yeah. mountain because they refused to, with their unbelieving hearts to enter the land that was right there. Yeah. Well, I know, Brahma, you, of fun. you've got to go <laughs> soon. How much time do you have, sir? And you've got a show tonight. Well, the next show starts at 7, so I've got right up until 7. However long you guys want to go up to 7 is fine. That's in, I'm an hour ahead of you, I think. So that's, oh, you sorry. have about 20. Uh, 25 more minutes. minutes. Okay, cool. Um. Okay, so what? Yeah, time zones. Let me look through my notes. What have we not <laughs> touched on? We did you, the. You want one that that's it, it's the, it starts off the book kind of that got me. Yeah, because it's such a pitfall for so many people. He starts talking about, oh, your subject's going to church. Well, get him to focus on the people around him at church. <laughs> and it's like that. That is such a thing you hear people. And it's a true thing. It is disheartening when you see hypocritical people. Um, but like you can't use that as an excuse as to why you are not serving God. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm so reminded of Paul when Paul's writing to Timothy, he keeps using the phrase, but for you, but for you, you know, 
basically forget what they're doing, but for you, like you do this man of God. Uh, and basically just the point being like, stop looking with the peripheral vision, like you focus on the Lord and like, stop looking to the left or right. But so many people do, they, they focus on it, that. You hear that as like the number one excuse all the time as to why someone doesn't serve the Lord. Uh, they look to people instead of looking at God. And they also look at in that part, you're reminding me, he said, especially if they're a new convert and they're an yeah. adult, you know, that they have, they might come in with these ideas of Christians as wearing togas and not that they really expect that, but they, they, they consider it to be this very serious um, and, and uh, almost like from a movie and they get there and these are just ordinary humans, sinners like them. And he's, you know, what did they expect? What did they think their pew mate was going to be? But they'll look around and they look at the humanness of the people. And then they're like, is my religion ridiculous? Like these yeah. are all broken humans <laughs> with problems. It's like, yes, <laughs> that's what it is. But it's kind of like when you see, and I don't mean this mean at all, when you see someone really overweight at the gym, like I would never, ever mock that because that's where they need to be. Yes. Like that they're right. trying to improve their life like that. That should be applauded. Never looked down upon. Yes. I love that. Uh, I didn't have that particular. I didn't have that one wasn't a particular thing for me when I was at. When I first started going as a new believer. Um, but I did have some of the other some of the other things that we've touched on. What I like about the way he writes is that he just he's so gifted of just drawing this stuff out that you haven't recognized about yeah. yourself do you know what i mean oh absolutely um, yep and i mean um, i told you the biggest one for me was the time the whole thing on time like that yeah. that one did bring tears to my eyes as i pondered it and thought about it okay let me see what else is in my notes oh I had this one it's where it's during one of those dark periods, one of those, those lulls of the patient where the human's feeling kind of far from God and he's been participating in some sins or, you know, getting further away from God at the very least. And then screw tape becomes angry with the younger demon. Cause he's like, you know, what happened today? Now he's closer to the enemies, closer to God. You allowed him to enjoy two simple pleasures. Yep. Um, reading a book and taking a reading, walk, reading a book and taking a walk. And, and it just, that is again, a brilliant way of writing because he's telling you how important these things are. Think simple pleasures. And I like the fact that he also had a caveat with reading, but he said reading a book that he read simply because he wanted to read it and not so right. he could sound smart at dinner parties or whatever, <laughs> you know, like it was an actual not pleasure. So he could you run know? a stream. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but the beauty of this one is I want, I think we all wanted to read this one. So yeah, it, feel so, <laughs> it, yeah, it had been on my it. list for, for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. And I want to correct. I, it, it, Paul doesn't say, but for you, as for you, as for you, he keeps saying that to Timothy, like people are doing this, this and that, but as for you, like you do this yeah. kind of thing, you like, are almost separate. turn his head this way. <laughs> you go that way. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I had one more. It wouldn't, uh, yeah. it probably wouldn't be a stream with me on it without uh, getting a little bit of politics in there. So, um, <laughs> he the, did get into that the a letter, a, the letter on malice. Um, the great thing is to direct the malice to his immediate neighbors whom he meets every day and to thrust his benevolence out to the remote circumference to people he does not know. The malice thus becomes wholly real and the benevolence largely imaginary. It's not directly yes. political, but if you look at the way the political parties act, at least here in the U.S., and the left claims to be charitable by giving to the broader populace, by taking from their neighbors and communities and acquaintances. The right feels that they're charitable by treating the people at their base level good, their friends, their family, their community, and hoping that upon that foundation, good sprouts. So... Mm -hmm. I, I did take that one. Had to throw in a little bit of the politics because that's what I do. No, but you're exactly right. I remember that part also stood out to me because 
it is all about the, um, I used to hear, I used to hear that when I, you know, I'm, I'm from the South, I'm from South Carolina. And when I spent some time in New York, um, for my, in my old life, and I had heard people say before that, um, down South, the racism down South that exists, um, towards black people is, um, it's, it's pushed outward, it, but every, all the white people down there, they are very loving and accepting of the black people they know of their neighbors. But if they do have racist beliefs, it's sort of this imaginary, this thing of like the blacks, right? <laughs> but they don't treat right. people that they know differently, um, which is, it's kind of odd. Whereas North, if you do get a racist, it's the opposite. It's like, yes, um, they, they, <laughs> they say they don't have any problem with black people and, you know, at large on mass, it's, you know, that I am a non-racist, but individually, like they either don't know any black people or don't socialize with black and people they get, or, they get they do, or they get nervous yeah. around yeah. them or they're like Robin DeAngelo. They go to a picnic and there's black people there and in her book, white privilege, she's like, Oh, is I going to have to sit with the black people? And like, yeah. <laughs> that's why that, I think that's why she wrote that whole book. She thought all white people were like that, like her, but, um, yeah. But it, but it made me think of that too. It's it's what you're talking about, like where they they put their the left does the social justice woke left. They do tend to put their feelings of goodwill towards humanity on this sort of imaginary on the masses level. Like I have no problem with this people or these people or I care about people at large, right? But when it comes to how they treat right. people individually and who they know. You don't see any fruits of the spirit there. Yes. Sometimes. Yeah. So. Well, the was... only last, the last thing I've got written down, uh, cause we already touched some of the other things, uh, but we've already touched this. I, but this was a quote, nothing natural is on our side. I thought that was on the demon side. Yes. Right. <laughs> It's this goes like, for yeah. milk too. You should not be drinking that weird nut milk, guys. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> my I'm husband glad you and didn't I go with the different vision version of that joke. <laughs> oh, I don't know that. <laughs> you know oh, no, if we were on that show, oh man, I would have just walked into something. Yeah, <laughs> set myself up. Uh, uh, lately. We've been, um, I was reading about fasting for the Advent fast and stuff. And then my husband's been reading a lot about cutting out seed oils and all these non-natural things or not as not right. You know, like cooking with butter, which is natural rather than cooking with something that you spray out of a can or yeah. whatever. Or <laughs> and, even margarine. Uh, right. And uh, so I've been, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, the natural yeah, well, I mean, we, we, we're body, mind, and spirit. Like, you see that. You see even, uh, we were talking about kind of perversion, twisting. You see that with kids today and what they can eat. Like, my, this new generation, like, their palates are tiny. But, yeah. but they're, re like, like, I mean, I'm saying little kids. And, and I know kids struggle, but I'm just saying it's, it's exceptionally bad even to high school at this point. A whole generation and why is that? Well, because we gave them processed foods, high sugar from the time they were babies. And then once they're introduced to that with a with a underdeveloped brain, they don't want what's healthy. They want what tastes good. <laughs> you know, so the, the point I'm trying to make there is even in even in our appetites, like we've we developed these very unnatural uh, tendencies and habits that can lead to, you know, elevate depression, can make you feel bad, you know, all this, all that type stuff. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, there, was, okay. there was one other section of the book that I thought was kind of funny. Um, and it has to do with food. Which, um, which What one? did you guys think of, uh, of the patient's mother? How she's yes. described with the gluttony <laughs> and funny. the, uh, I mean, she's not a glutton in that she overdoes things. She's a glutton in that she has to have everything her way. I immediately went to the Karen. You know, yes. you get yes. your plate and you tell the waitress, well, I ordered half a sandwich, not a full sandwich. So go make me a new sandwich, not this one. And don't just cut this one in half. Make me a new half sandwich, that kind of thing. Yes. And she thinks she's not a glutton because she wants so very little because she's but, taking very little yeah, yeah. but it's so specific and, 
how she's hated by hostess hostesses <laughs> everywhere and i think we've yep. all known someone like that i knew someone like that who i i was embarrassed to go to a restaurant because it was like with them because i knew that it, they were going to send things back and there will be a like scene crap and yes i knew a person like that every meal <laughs> yeah oh man also there's a line in there about um she was a person who lived for others you could tell who the others were by their hunted expression <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like oh they know a lot of overbearing so overbearing personality type which more often than not sometimes that personality type seems to be more of a woman um well and he talks about that a little bit the differences between men and women yes. women are defined by their unselfishness and doing things for others where men are defined by their want to not cause anybody else mm. to have to do something for them or yes. do an unselfish act for them because they just want to not do you know they want to do their thing and make sure that it's not bugging anybody else yes and he said you can cause going a lot to of either extreme causes issues between the sexes and to your to yourself and that you can exploit that and cause in a relationship a man and woman to start to view each other as selfish because men and women tend to define unselfishness differently. Yes. And so they start to see each other as like, well, you're not unselfish in the way that I am, you know? Yeah. Um, I have a, I have a question. I start here. Um, I thought this one was great. First of all, hello. Epic Mike was here. I don't know if he's still here. Hello, sir. It's good to see you. What's up, Epic you'll, Mike? you'll have to come join us sometime for one of these. And then also your average Patriot nerd gave a dollar ninety nine. Thank you so much for the super chat and a double one over at Michelle's channel. A dollar ninety nine. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Thank you very much. Uh, true. Uh, truly enjoyed this. This Annabelle. Well, thank you, Annabelle. We were really enjoying these. Here's the question, John. How do you love God with all of your strength if you've got none? Ask for I would, strength. I would say pray. First thing I would do is pray for strength. If well, I feel... and, and that is a, a natural inner working of the Holy Spirit in our life to where we're able to freely love God with all that's within us. Like I would say you cannot do that until you are born again. Um, Because you get what I'm saying? Like that's not until you're born again. Like the heart's not been purified and an unpurified heart can't love a holy, pure God with all their heart. Um, so I, I would just say due to the grace of God and the Holy Spirit within you, we can love God with all of our heart, strength, mind, all of our soul. It, it's supernatural. Would, is what I'm trying to say there. Well, I all that to yeah. say that. <laughs> but I would also add that if you're having... Um, Oh, I just had this conversation with someone recently. If you pray for something, maybe you and I talked about this, Michelle. I can't remember. If you pray for strength, it's not, in my experience anyway, it's not like God just magically, um, I wake up the next day and I'm strong. No, he gives me pretty much immediately an opportunity to prove strength. And usually the first time that opportunity comes, I fail. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> then, or if you pray for courage, you better get ready the next day for some kind of situation that's going to cause you to need courage and you may not be good at doing it. Or if you pray for patience, this has happened in, in our marriage where it's like you pray for patience and then like right after there's a situation where you don't show it and you're like, oh, afterwards, like, oh, I get it. I just failed. <laughs> Yeah. Well, like it's like you grow it through those opportunities yes right. and and absolutely and that that's kind of going back to what i'm saying too i actually think of i think a good example um gideon in the book of judges the angel comes to gideon and he tell gideon's afraid and and the the angel tells gideon go in the strength that you have and I believe we are to love God with what we have. But and as we continue to grow in grace, it will be more and more until it's just holy and undividedly. Uh, we have an undivided heart um, to where it belongs, I mean, fully to God. But I think it is kind of, you keep growing in that love. That love keeps getting stronger and stronger and more and more 
uh, but you start with wherever you are and God accepts that. And, and something I think of too, uh, at the end of the book of John, when Jesus says to Peter, when Jesus is resurrected and he comes back and he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, you know, I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? He says again, yes, feed my lambs or shepherd my lambs. And then the third time he says it. Now, obviously in the Greek, there's multiple different words for love. But the third time you could actually translate it, Peter, are you my friend? And the way I take that is God was like, okay, Peter, you're not necessarily here yet, but I'm going to meet you where you are. Are you my friend? Mm -hmm. And then it feed my sheep. Um, you go and say, so I, back to that question, I got like, we love God with all that we have at that moment. And, and God accepts that, I believe. Uh, and God will meet us where we are is where I'm trying to, to go there, yeah. but we can keep growing in it. Agreed. John, God follows. won't give you more than you can handle. <laughs> That's not just praying for patience. <laughs> Because I got tired of waiting at red lights. Stop praying for patience. I see that. So you already know. So pray for strength. And <laughs> uh, okay. I think, I think let's wind it up. Yeah. Uh, you guys, I, I just love this. I love having these conversations so much. So thank you both for being here tonight. And Brahma, I know you have another one to run to. Where can people find you after this and in general? Well, in seven minutes, I'll be over on Comics Division's Rumble channel for uh, yelling at parked cars. It's highly political, so if you don't like politics, probably not the one for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> then later tonight, in another, what, five hours, I'll be on the midweek hump after show with uh, the Shagsworth. And then Saturday nights, I do my show, Bourbon and Boarding. Uh, we talk uh, talk about the weekend hockey over on my Rumble and YouTube, and that '70s rock fan does that one with me. So, yeah, but yeah, it's every one of these has been fun. Uh, there's a few more books we could probably do that would be books that uh, are like this. They're fairly easy reads and fairly easy to comprehend and take stuff out of them. I was thinking maybe the Pilgrim's Progress at some point. Yeah, haven't I've revisited never read that, that one in a long time. I've never read that. It's a good one. It's it's a, I know it's a classic. Yes. And it it's an easy read. It's a long read, I think. I can't remember how big it is, but it's a good one. Cool. Well, thank you so much and uh and Michelle, where can people find you? Yes, you can find me and my sister at Forceify Entertainment on YouTube. We are trying to we we're close. So if you're not subscribed, go subscribe because we're trying to get 25k before December 25th. Uh, we're getting very close to that. So go check us out. Uh, we just did our first time watching reaction of A Nightmare Before Christmas. And then after that, I'll just go ahead and tell you on this channel, we've got um, a first time watching reaction of The Long Kiss Goodnight, as Carrie recommended, and Scrooged, and It's a Wonderful Life. So we've got quite a few Christmas ones coming your way. So if you're interested... Uh, go check us out. I also did last week a review for the the new Christian the Angel Studios movie, The Shift. And if any of you are interested in seeing that in theaters, if you go to my review of The Shift, you can get a 10% discount uh, through a link that I have in my description. So check us Which out. Which is probably a lot. The story for of tickets. Job in the multiverse. Yes, that's, that's yeah. exactly what it is. <laughs> okay. That's how I've heard it described. So, all right. <laughs> Okay, before we take off, I just have one more. I'm going to put up Tina Guzman just asked, says, I love these streams. I am requesting prayer. Just remember me if you could, and thank you. Yes, we'll definitely will, yeah. Tina. Um, okay, cool. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, again, my name is Carrie uh, Smith here at Deep Programmed. And uh, on on this channel, I, I think, yes, I'll be seeing you guys on Friday uh, at the usual time at one o'clock central. Um, but thanks for tuning in for another that Christian panel. If you like it, the reason we're, we're also we're doing simulcasting is we just want as many people as possible to um, feel welcome and and to see it. And, you know, so if you like this video, please consider sharing it or hitting like because that helps the algorithm. And we'll see you guys later. Bye. See you guys. Bye.
Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Yeah, just in case we don't have another before then. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> Bye-bye.